Hello everyone, my name is Laura and this is Our Class Expert Talks. I'm sure almost everyone has had a job interview. Sometimes it's daunting, sometimes it is very exciting, but most of the time you walk out of the room wondering, so how exactly did I do? What we also need to understand is that the pressure of interviews also applies to the people on the other side of the table, HR specialists, team leaders, managers, and CEOs. Several factors go into interviewing, including good preparation, good listening skills, consistency, all of which result in effective selection. In this expert talk, we're going to discuss how to be a good interviewer and how to hire the best candidate for your company. Today, I am joined by learning and development consultant, Ara class instructor, Martin Horan, who's going to help us answer our questions about job interviews. So thank you very much for joining me today, Martin. Most welcome. Wonderful. So Martin, uh, in these talks, uh, we're going to do exactly the same way like we did the, uh, like I did with the previous instructors. And we're going to just talk about you, about your experience, about aviation in your life, as well as your course at our class. So let's begin and tell us about the beginnings of your career and its connection to aviation. Well, I started my career, my formal career in aviation. I joined Aer Lingus, which is the national airline in Ireland, as a ground operations uh, clerical officer. Uh, so I worked at check-in, in the boarding area, flight information, uh, fantastic grounding in uh, in my career and in aviation in general. I remember, uh, Laura, we had a three-week training program uh, to prepare us uh, to work at to check-in uh, that covered all aspects of the role. Uh, it was fascinating and it was a really good experience. I don't think the airlines these days invest quite as much um, in the whole process as they did back then, but it was really uh, formative and really beneficial and, and a great start to my career. And then moving forward from your very first role, you know, you've got many years of experience and that's why you're a consultant right now. Is there anything that stands out for you or something that you wish you could go back to and do it all over again? Gosh, uh, that's an interesting uh, way of going at, at uh, career. Um, I don't think so. I, I've been very lucky in terms of the, the opportunities that I've had, the different organizations, different airlines that I've worked for. Um, and different roles that I've had with those. And that led me then into the role of working for myself as a consultant and having the opportunity to share some of the experience and knowledge and skills and theories and techniques that I've learned down through the years with others in airlines and other sectors uh, and industries and geographies throughout the world. So, yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I don't think I'd go back and change anything significant at this stage. Can we, yeah, can we say that everything happens for a reason then? Yeah, yeah, sure. And, you know, they say that uh, there's there's uh, an opportunity in every problem or, or that optimistic people see opportunities in every in every problem. Of course, the other side of the coin is pessimists see uh, problems in every opportunity. Uh, so I'd like to see myself as being one of the former as opposed to the latter. And the various moves that I made uh, and promotions within organizations uh, and opportunities that I took advantage of turned out to be really beneficial. Um, a lot of challenge, learning, progress, and enjoyment. Um, so um, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, what's the expression that's used? Every day is a learning day. Sure thing. But you, you absolutely, you know, uh, from your career, you surely met so many people. You've met different kinds of people as well. Can you say what is needed to be successful in, let's say aviation, let's focus on this industry. What is needed to be successful in this industry? Actually, Laura, I've worked in a, a range of different industries and sectors, a lot of experience in aviation in particular. And there's one word that I would use in answer to that question across the board, but particularly for aviation. And the word is enthusiasm. Really, if you believe in what you're doing, if you like what you're doing, if you enjoy it, if you're enthusiastic about it, uh, it makes such a difference. I, I do some training of people for presentations on occasion, and I say to people, look, if you're not enthusiastic about your presentation, about your topic, send a memo, <laughs> send an email, <laughs> don't make a presentation. And the same thing in relation to working at check-in, being cabin crew, uh, being an air traffic controller, working in a manufacturing plant uh, on aircraft engines. It's so, so important to want to do it 
to enjoy it, to feel that it's important. Uh, and this comes through very much in terms of uh, interview skills as well, uh, that when people come into the room um, and show enthusiasm for, for the role that they're going for, for the organization that they want to join, that's something that, uh, that you just can't train. It's, it's inherent in people. Um, and interviewers, uh, I think, need to pay a lot more attention to that oftentimes than to the fact that this person doesn't have Microsoft Excel experience. You know, if they've shown that they have the ability and willingness to learn other things in other areas, they'll pick up the Microsoft Excel in no time at all. Far more important, being enthusiastic. That's what I, I think is, is key to success and particularly in aviation. And how does then uh, aviation compare to other industries? Because obviously, you know, there are some similarities, some differences, but I'm sure there must be something predominantly different. So when you come into aviation, you have to be prepared for it. Because usually when I ask this question to other instructors, what they say is that adaptability is crucially important here because obviously we're going through so many different crises. We go through many different challenges and I think, and I agree with them that it's needed, but what do you think? Yeah, adaptability is, is, is crucial. Now, in, in fairness, I've just come from a project working with uh, uh, the, the project managers of a, a data center build in, in Central Europe. Um, and they would talk about the need for adaptability and the massive changes and uh, requirements there for sure. Um, in terms of aviation in, in particular, um, for sure adaptability is, is, is important, but in, even more so, I suppose, is that willingness to be able to, to learn as you go. Um, systems are changing all the time, IT systems. Uh, um, customer, passenger requirements are changing all the time. Um, manufacturers' needs, uh, climate and environment, all of these factors uh, link into what's happening in our sector, in aviation, that make, uh, make it particularly challenging and particularly important that the person is enthusiastic, going back to what I said, but enthousi enthusiastic about, about change as well, and not seeing change as something uh, catastrophic and, and threatening and oh my god but rather seeing it as well we've changed and grown and learned previously we can do it again um, and, and just bring it on so being enthusiastic about change as well so yeah I, I like your, your your suggestion about aviation requiring adaptability maybe more than other sectors I would expand a little bit on this with uh, some apologies to my clients in other sectors uh, like in public service or in the financial services world aviation people tend to be more fun they tend um i don't know to have a sense of humor um a sense of the possibility um that's just been my experience down through the years i've worked with 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 Aer Lingus obviously early in my career but i worked with airlines in the middle east in the Far East, uh, in Australasia, in the US, and, and in Africa. And my goodness, um, the people that you get working for airlines and working in aviation, they're different, <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> so um, you mentioned something that I like. You said you have to learn as you go and I think what can help you do that is uh, taking some additional courses, let's say, you know, digital learning courses at ARA class. Uh, so I want to hear your thoughts on how this can help someone overcome challenges that they face in their career or maybe in their career development. If something is missing, can digital training be the way to go? It absolutely is essential these days, given the world that we're in currently. And it is essential in terms of uh, two aspects, one of which is oftentimes forming a foundation. Uh, so if I need to, to develop my skills in a particular IT area or in a particular soft skill area, I need to, to do some reading, some background, some uh, self-assessment. And digital will help me to do that very quickly and very effectively. And I can do it in my own time. I can do it at my own pace. I can do it in my own place, all of which is, is very uh, beneficial. The challenge then, and it's, it's something that Aeroclass have done quite well, is taking what uh, the person does online or in a virtual setting and um, helping them to think about, OK, how do I apply this in a practical situation? Uh, how can I bring this into my role? How can I practice this uh, feedback technique with, with a colleague? Um, and, and some of the sessions that we run, I know, uh, will bring people back subsequently, uh, having done the foundation stuff, 
having uh, been introduced to the tool or the technique or the theory and then being sent away with a with an action plan in terms of okay over the next month practice this and then come back and talk to us uh, virtually as we're doing here uh, about how that went uh, what were the successes uh, what were the surprises um, and, and what was the learning that you took out of it and, and how will you do this again in the future and do it better uh, so there's a combination we talk these days uh, laura very um, common phrase is blended learning and digital is a crucial part of that uh, it saves time it saves money um, it, it deals with those basics but it needs to be linked in as well to what people do on the job and it needs to be practical and that's one of the things certainly in the program that i've done and, and others that are in the pipeline is to build in that practical application so the use of tools uh, the application of the techniques uh, and then the uh, potential for follow-up and feedback in terms of how did that go what did you learn from that what needs to be uh, repeated or maybe done differently next time i see so you have a course titled how to recruit and attract talent in the aviation industry at RCLS. Can you introduce it to our viewers just very quickly? What is it about and who is it aimed at? Well, as the name implies, it's named at recruiters in the aviation sector. So people who, who conduct interviews, whether that's in, in airlines or airport authorities or any aspect of, this, of the sector, uh, for any role within the sector, whether it's a cabin crew member or whether it's a flight uh, aircraft engineer, um, and it, it deals with some of these issues that, that have become so commonplace in interviews. Um, it, it helping interviewers, I would define a successful interview very simply. It's picking the, the right candidate for the role efficiently and effectively, while at the same time leaving unsuccessful candidates feeling they were dealt with professionally. Okay? So it isn't just about, you know, asking all the right questions and getting the best person and doing it cheaply and quickly. It's also about the fact that Laura may come along for a job today and she's not perfect for it, or maybe there was somebody better for it, but we don't want her going away thinking, uh, well, that's a terrible outfit. I don't, don't ever want to work for them again and telling all her friends and associates and colleagues about it. I want her going away with a very positive experience. They were professional. That's a professional organization. Given the chance, I'd like to work with them in the future because given the opportunity, we might like to have you in the future because you might be perfect for it another role. Um, so expanding a little bit, um, talking about some of the don'ts. Don't ask people what's their greatest weakness. Don't ask people where they see themselves in 10 years time. Uh, unless you're interviewing that latter one, unless you're interviewing for a potential chief executive and you want to know how he or she sees themselves and the organization in 10 years time. Yeah, that's okay. If you're interviewing a uh, a person for the revenue department in your organization, uh, you know, as a, a team leader, where they see themselves in 10 years time, my goodness, you know, think 10 years forward from now, or indeed think what's happened in the last two years, never mind 10. It's a very difficult thing to predict. Um, so people have all sorts of foibles, uh, personal likes, um, you know, prejudices that they bring into the interview. Now there's an interesting issue, the whole issue of unconscious bias that so many interviewers are completely unaware of. And I'm not just talking about capital B biases, you know, the obvious ones about male and female or uh, age, etc. There's there's unconscious bias that come, can come into it. Um, you know, somebody with uh, uh, from the same country as me or from the same town as me. I'm, I'm automatically drawn to that person. I need to be careful about it. Uh, it's one of the things I often say uh, to people uh, that I'm interviewing with. I, I carry out a lot of interviews myself and I'm, I'm very aware of and I've done the unconscious bias test. There's a Harvard test that you can do, which highlighted this to me. I'm aware of a, a bias that was unconscious and is now conscious on my behalf that I have. And I declare this to my colleague interviewers because it's important that they be aware of it in me and I need to be aware of it in myself. My unconscious bias is this. I'm very favorably disposed to young, smart, ambitious females. Because in my career, I've worked with a lot of very effective, young, smart, um, success, um, ambitious females. So I need to be very careful when one of these <laughs> types of individuals comes into an interview, not to immediately think, oh, this is great. Laura is going to be brilliant because, no, that's not necessarily the case. Often is the case, I'll be honest, but not always. So mm -hmm. there's a, a bias that, you know, an interviewer is in interview situations. 
have loads of those that they may not be aware of. Um, so these are the sort of issues that we talk about on the course, in addition to how to prepare effectively. What are the sort of things that you need to do before you meet the candidate? Then in this situation itself, the competency-based approach to interviewing, being clear what it is that you're looking for and asking questions that will uncover that. So let me give you, you know, an example. Loads of interviewers would say, let's say I'm interviewing you, Laura, for a, a role in, in frontline passenger handling. Uh, so, Laura, tell me, how would you deal with a situation where a passenger is um, very rude and unreasonable? OK, now that sounds like quite a good question because it's a sort of situation that may very, very often arise in uh, the front line. But the big problem I have with it is the hypothetical nature of it. How would you deal with? Mm. And the problem with that is Laura can give a great answer to that question, but there's no guarantee that that's what she would actually do. So a much better approach is to say, Laura, give me an example of when you've had to deal with somebody who was behaving in a rude or unreasonable way. What did you do? Now I'm dealing with uh, history, with facts, with evidence, and I can explore that. So when you said that, how did they react? What was their response? How did that make you feel? What was the outcome? What did you learn from that? When you had to deal with a similar situation in the future, did you do it the same or did you do anything differently? So there are some of the issues that come up in, in the course uh, that we talk about and we help people in terms of planning for how they're going to uh, structure their interview, the sort of questions that they're going to ask, what competencies are important in the roles that they're going for, and how to evaluate answers that they get. So, so for example, that how would you deal with? Very difficult to evaluate that answer because you don't know, is that really what they would do or not? Whereas if I'm looking for specific practical detail in terms of something that you've done in the past, I can actually define maybe even different levels of uh, expertise, different levels of effectiveness, and I could rate you on high, medium or low versus the other candidates that I'm seeing and their answers to that question as well. So this issue of, of being clear about what I want to ask and therefore what I'm looking for is very important. So that, in a nutshell, describes our very significantly longer course on interviewing skills for, for the aviation sector. Well, let's get more into it, because now I'm interested. I'm sure our viewers are as well. And there are a few things I want to pick up on. Uh, the unconscious bias uh, idea, I think it's quite fascinating. But um, I'm wondering, you know, because I have been involved in the recruitment process myself, uh, there's this very thin line between choosing a candidate to interview and mm. kind of just, you know, putting his or her CV on the side thinking maybe it's not the time. Mm. So how to kind of find that right balance between giving someone a chance and being critical? Because there are people who were given opportunities without having any experience and they have proven themselves time and time again that they were worth it. But then, you know, you see someone with a wonderful polished CV and you think, wow, this is this is, you know, 10 out of 10. <laughs> and then they join the organization and you see that something's not quite right. So how to find that balance? OK, let me start at the end. First of all, one of the key elements of successful selection and one of the key uh, steps that we often kind of take for granted and leave to the side is probation. Interviewing is not a science. There's a lot of art to it. Um, and we do sometimes make mistakes at interview because of the polished CV and maybe even the more polished performance at interview. And we hire a person who turns out not to be what we thought. Um, you have three months or in some cases six months to actually carry out a much longer interview. And I strongly would encourage all employers and interviewers to use that three month interview. And if at the end of that three months, you have experienced significant issues or problems or difficulties with the candidate, shake their hand, wish them the best of luck in their uh, future career with another organization. It may be that uh, actually this wasn't the job for them and not their fault. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, you have the evidence now. So let me start from that part of the, the process. And that's something that I emphasize on the course as well. So let's come back to this issue right in advance of the interview altogether. 
there's a technique that we talk about on the, the course, which is job analysis, which is a bit different from the job description. With job analysis, we ask people to take some time in advance of the interview to describe what it is that the job holder does. What are their activities in the role? And to list them down, and, and ideally this should be done by the manager and maybe an existing job holder. Uh, so, so what are the activities, you know, uh, prepares reports for, um, uh, handles passengers in, completes, uh, analyzes, um, and, and there's a, a clue there. All of the activities will start with a verb, and it'll be quite a long list. When you've done that, the next step is to go down and say, okay, which are the essential elements here for the person to be successful in the role? And they will be maybe five, 10 items that you know they really need to do and to do well in order to be successful. And I would call these the musts, if you like. The others then become your desirables or your wants. Having identified your, your musts, what you can then say is, okay, what competencies, skills, abilities will the person require in order to be able to do these tasks? And there'll be things like uh, IT skills, for example, um, uh, interpersonal relationships, uh, problem solving, etc. And the value in this, if you're, if you're recruiting uh, an analyst programmer, for example, who will need to have X, Y, Z languages and so on, the IT skills that you've written over here will be very different in depth and breadth to the IT skills that an administrative officer might need. But you'll know that because you're so familiar with the job. Now you have your list of key competencies, abilities, skills, that you'll know these are the things that we need to focus on in interview when we get there. But this will also help you when you're looking at the CVs. And at this stage, you should be saying, okay, we know now what are our essentials, our musts. And if the candidate doesn't hit the musts on their CV, then we don't interview them. Word of caution here. People often say, well, if they have five years experience as a, whatever it is that we're looking for, that's good enough, or 10 years. Or if they have a master's degree in, that's good enough. Um, I'm always wary about that because ex very high levels of qualifications don't always a perfect candidate make. And also very high levels of, of uh, qualifications as a minimum requirement may exclude a perfect candidate. So don't set master's degree if somebody with uh, secondary education would be able to do the job. And don't set tenure uh, experience levels if somebody with one year might be quite good at doing the job. So um, this is a roundabout in terms of answering your question. There's no easy answer, by the way. No easy, no perfect answer. There is still the potential for interviewing somebody who turns out at interview, you say, oh my God, they looked much better on their CV. You know, they don't have it at all. That happens. And you have to be willing to take that. The bigger risk is uh, not interviewing somebody uh, who would have been great for the job. But the best way around that is being clear about what are these competencies that match with the activities that the person has to has to carry out. A bit long-winded. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. Because um, whenever you're looking for a job, um, we usually, let's say if my friend says that, um, oh, I'm looking for a new job, but I don't think I'm suitable for it. I know that my answer for him would be just apply. Like what's the worst that can happen? Just yeah. apply. Maybe they'll look at your CV and they'll be like, oh, let's, let's try it. But when you're in the that position, you kind of feel like, well, well there's just no point like you lose all the hope you know and you're just like oh, i'm definitely you know i don't have enough experience i don't have i don't know certain education that it's suitable and stuff like that so i guess you know it goes both ways because we're not wary when we're applying for a job and then the recruiter is a bit wary when choosing someone who to interview well, let me like interrupt someone is... let me interrupt yeah, yeah, yeah. because I regularly talk with people and there's here's an interesting issue in, in relation to my conscious bias that I'm aware of. And this is a male female thing, you know, the men are from Mars, women are from, from Venus issue. But this in relation to interview jobs, um, men are from one planet and women are from another because men will look at a job description or an advertisement. Uh, and, you know, there'll be seven requirements listed and they'll say, oh, that's, that's fine. I have I have four of those. Or I have five of those. I, I'll give a go at that. Women will look at the same requirement and there's seven and they say, well, I don't have the seventh one. I won't apply. And one of the things sometimes that I say to women 
you, particularly young women, is, you know, when you're going for this job, one of the things you should do is pretend to be a man. In this aspect, don't, don't be so um, lacking in confidence. The fact that you're missing one out of seven, you have other experience, uh, abilities, uh, examples, evidence to show that you will very quickly pick up on that. And, and, and the same issue from the interviewer's perspective is not to be so handcuffed to your set of uh, requirements that you, you, you know, going back to remember I said about essentials and desirables, your musts and your wants, recognize that some of the desirables are just desirable, you know, and that the fact that this person is so strong in some of the others, we'll accept the fact that he or she doesn't have this. So uh, you're right with your friend. Advise them. Go for it. What's the worst that could happen? Good advice, yes. <laughs> um, but also, um, I'm sure someone who's watching now is in charge of recruiting. And when you're an HR manager specialist or just in recruitment, you sometimes have to interview someone, as you said, for a C-suite uh, a position, let's say a CEO, CMO or whatever. Mm. But then at the same time, you have to interview a person for a call center position in your you know, customer service uh, mm. specialist. Should it have the same level of scrutiny when choosing a candidate? How do you kind of balance it out? The big difference goes back to my question, or, you know, when I poo pooed the 10 years, you know, how do you see yourself in 10 years time? But I said the exception was if you're interviewing at very senior levels, that's a much more appropriate question. The big difference for an interviewer at senior level is it's going to be so much more future focused. So uh, Laura, you're coming in now as chief financial officer. You've had the opportunity to take a look at our organization and at our financial structure and at our ratios and so on. Where do you see the opportunities? Where do you see the challenges for us in the next three to five years? What would be some of the uh, initial steps that you would take to restructure how we operate financially? Um, what do you see as some of the opportunities that we have nationally and globally uh, talk me through that. So that's not an approach that I'm going to take with a call center person. The call center person I'm going to be saying, so uh, Laura, give me an example of, maybe they have no experience in a call center. Give me an example of uh, how you've uh, managed a difficult communication in the past. Maybe with a, a lecturer at, at, at college, maybe with your with one of your um, teammates in, in, in school, maybe with your parent. Um, tell me about a time where you had to um, to get something done and you had very little time to do it where you're under a lot of pressure how did you handle that so with the call center person or a much more junior level of person it's that competency approach based on uh, and the principle is a really simple one past behavior is the best predictor predictor of future performance but the senior level people i'm kind of taking that as a given i've read your cv i can see that you were you know very senior level uh, executive vice president in that you have extensive experience of. So I'm interested in how you're going to bring that to to bear for us. Um, and, and what do you see as the, the big picture issues, the capital L leadership challenges in the role that you're going to be performing? Uh, so that's the difference when that HR person has to, to move from here to interviewing at the much more junior level. I see. And now moving to another side of things, um, we have so many different companies and so many different interviewing practices. Let's say if you're in the UK, you just graduated, you want to enter a grad scheme, you go through a phone interview, a personality test, I think. Then you have another interview and so many interviews and then you might not even get the job. And you have to do this quite a lot because you're looking for that perfect grad scheme that you wanted. Then there are companies that only have you come in once, mm. even if it's you know not that m it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a junior role, does it? Like, it's just, they find you, they like you, they offer you a job. So how to clarify your process as an recruitment manager while selecting a new hire, or at least how to find a way, how many interviews I need to do and how I should approach this process. From from the HR perspective, now this is, this is a, you know, capital H, HR stuff. They need to be much more um, transparent uh, and open in their communication with uh, candidates. Uh, so for example, one simple thing, it drives me bananas when companies don't respond to job applicants. They put out an advertisement, 
they get a you know a, an application and the, the applicants secure nothing and the, the companies and organizations and this happens across the globe kind of assume well you know if we want we if we want you we'll we'll call you don't call us we'll call you it's just terrible a simple email response saying thank you for your application at this time uh, you know you have not been successful so that's part one part two is this thank you for your application uh, we'd like you to attend for or we'd like you to at that stage if you're one of the lucky ones we should be telling you here's the stages of the process that you're going to go through um, and outlining to you you know initially we're going to ask you to go through a battery of tests uh, assessments online that will be followed up with the requirement for uh, a video presentation we'll send you the questions for that uh, which you'll have to complete and send back to us if you're successful at that stage then there will be a virtual interview etc 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 so that people know what they're letting themselves in for and that they have a, a predictable and understandable path to where this is going uh, to get into the role if because some people may say well I don't want to bother with that or that's too much or that doesn't suit me or I'm going to be on holidays uh, during a significant period of that time and I can't do it or, or I'm going to be on holidays in, in a significant period of that time I really want the job maybe I'll postpone my holidays or maybe I'll contact them and see can they deal with this uh, and make an exception for me or whatever it happens to be uh, so from the HR perspective we need to be better at that uh, as organizations um, it's, it's again back to this issue about leaving unsuccessful candidates feeling they've been professionally dealt with Here's an interesting issue I think that some organizations never take into account. The unsuccessful candidate could well turn out to be working for our regulator, for example. And the last thing that I want is somebody working for the regulator who thinks that my organization is terrible. Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody with a grudge um, against us. So treat people well, even when they've just applied for a job and you think, no, they're, they're not even suitable for the first stage. Let them know and let them know on time. Because I think one excuse that you would hear from hiring managers is that they don't have enough time to do all this because we have applications now coming not only through email, we have different services. We have LinkedIn now where you can just click and apply to a job and all these other places that the CVs are just coming through to you how to manage all that workload do you then need to have a team with you uh well, two two issues one of which is that they need to be uh, uh, more it savvy there's automated uh, ways of dealing with the the click on links and so on uh, that can be very effective um so so for example if you get an unsolicited application uh th there should be a way via linkedin for example there should be a way of automatically going back to the person saying we got your application we will look at it and if we're interested, we will get back to you. So that might cover that particular situation. Um, the other aspect of it, you're absolutely right. HR people will say, we're just inundated with applications. We can't deal with them all. I do understand, uh, you know, if you're getting completely unsolicited, not through LinkedIn, not through any other link, um, you may say, well, we didn't even ask the, the person to, to send us this. That may be part of an excuse. Mm, uh, I'm kind of doubtful about it. If somebody had the time to open it up and read it, you know, a very brief email back, I don't think is, is, is too much to expect. However, uh, that aside, the automation issue, I think, is, is the way around a, a lot of the other issues, uh, a lot of the other challenges. And it's down to HR working with the IT people and indeed loads of other providers out there who can provide that sort of service. I see. And now, after two years of working from home, looking for jobs at the comfort of your sofa, how has the practice of interviewing changed or has uh, it even yeah well it has yeah, people have got so much uh, more accustomed to zoom and ms teams and uh, skype before that um it, it's changed dramatically and it's changed for interviewers as well and it requires interviewers to be better prepared um because uh, i'm on a board with two other uh, colleagues uh, but they're you know seated <laughs> miles away from me, you know, an hour's drive away from me. They're in, in different countries, potentially. So we need to be better at uh, coordinating um, uh, in the interview itself. But from the candidate's perspective, um, this issue, even simple things, Laura, that you and I spoke about, about, you know, sitting in a position that's comfortable, that you have a reasonable background, that you're reasonably well lit, that the sound is good, 
all of that sort of stuff is, is important. The challenge for interviewers, coming back to my course, and I talk about this on a course, uh, about the challenge for the, the virtual interview, is establishing that rapport between you and the candidate. Uh, you know, somewhere or other trying to get them to relax and, and to feel reasonably comfortable. Um, a simple technique that I sometimes use when I open interviews uh, first thing in the morning, I might say uh, to the candidate, uh, Laura, thanks very much uh, for coming along this morning. It's lovely to meet you first thing. I, as I assume you had a wonderful restful night's sleep. And that generally just gets people to smile a little bit. And when they say, yes, I did, I say, I don't believe you. <laughs> and immediately, immediately then it, it relaxes. So, so somehow or other, you have to work that little bit harder because in the old, more normal situation, you shook hands, you had a chance maybe to go out and meet them outside, which I would recommend if that's the case, you know, don't have them formally issued in, uh, bring them in yourself. Um, so there are challenges on both sides of the screen for people, but we need to understand and accept that even post COVID, this is going to be more the norm. Organizations have discovered now, and indeed from candidates' perspective, it's better, uh, so that they don't have to travel from, you know, from Manchester to London to, uh, for the interview, or from from uh, you know, Illinois to New York, or, or or wherever it happens to be, from from Athlone to Dublin. They they can actually just sit, as you say, in in their own place and and go through it. And what's becoming increasingly increasingly common is people using uh, pre-recorded video as a shortlisting technique. So for example, if I'm recruiting for a middle management position in a, in a, a medium to large size organization, I might say, uh, okay, Laura, the, the first stage, no, well, you've submitted your application, that's fine, we've, uh, and we're going to call you to the first stage of the process, which is a, a pre-recorded video, uh, which you need to produce on your smartphone and uh, uh, send back to us. Uh, and there are three questions uh, for you to answer and we'll give you three minutes on each question. And question one is um, describe uh, uh, describe a project that you've managed and delivered to success from planning to inception. What, are this, what were the steps that you took? Uh, question two is uh, give us an example uh, to demonstrate your leadership uh, that you think would uh, be appropriate for the role that you're applying for. And question three is um, uh, Tell us about a time where you were to analyze a lot of data to reach a, de a decision. What was the approach of that? So you have, uh, so you produce that, you do it with your smartphone and you uh, send it back to them and they use that and look at those three minutes and decide whether they're going to call, nine minutes rather, and decide whether they're going to call you for for an, an, the next stage interview, which will probably also be formal, sorry, virtual, but it'll be live. So that's going to become ever more uh, common, I would suggest. Um, and it's it's people say oh my goodness it's very challenging but it's better than this which which used to be the case uh, because it's a it's a way of shortlisting and the, what used to be the case was they shortlisted based on what people had answered uh, on the application form uh, and this is much more real uh, and, and gives the person a much better opportunity to sell themselves and to communicate what they have to offer effectively um, so there are some of the changes that are happening now at, at senior level the c-suite you're still for sure going to have the face-to-face -face, uh, contact. And of course, you know, you made the point earlier on that different organizations have different approaches. I've been through it myself, where um, I've been called for an interview and, and they told me it'll be a day, not 40 minutes, it'll be a day, because I went along and I met the, the VP for X. I was then for half an hour, I was wheeled out of there into the VP for Y, the VP for Z, the general manager for, and I met over the course of the day, six different people, uh, the second last one was the chief executive and the last person was my potential boss. So over the course of the day, you had, you know, all those interviews and that still happens in some organizations. And what the six people do then is they get back together and they say, well, how did Martin compare with Laura, with John, with Jane and so on. There's one other technique that some organizations use as well as part of that, or in addition to that, they'll um, get the individual to meet with their teammates, maybe for lunch. Uh, maybe for a pizza or something like that. And so the team will have an opportunity to meet this new potential joiner. Um, different strokes for different folks. Um, but I do believe that team um, atmosphere is also very important. I think meeting your potential teammates can also give you an insight of what it's going to be like joining the team, but also give the team an insight into what it's going to be like. Is, is it going to change the dynamic with someone joining or not? And do you think it's a good practice then kind of 
inviting maybe a team not necessarily for lunch but maybe just to meet like some of the members it's a very good practice but it's massively expensive it, you know it takes a lot of time and investment if you consider are we going to do this with every potential candidate um, and do the team members have time to do it um but but it may very well be worth that investment depending on the, the importance of the dynamic within the team um and the level that you're recruiting at and uh, that may actually say, yeah, we should do this. Wonderful. Now, lastly, I want to kind of, because you have so much experience as an interviewer, and I'm sure our viewers want to use your, uh, pick your brain more likely, just to see, you know, how they can better improve for their next job interview when they're looking for a job. And uh, I'm going to kind of put myself as a guinea pig. There's one question that I really dislike in job interviews. I'm not even sure if it's a good interview question, but whenever I sit down in front of my computer or in front of a person that is interviewing me, they ask me, so Laura, tell us about yourself. And no matter how much I prepare for this, no matter how many scripts I write to myself, every time I just get a blog because at that moment I realized I don't know what to say do I need to focus on my experience do I need to focus on my hobbies do I need to focus on myself as a person what do I say and usually just kind of goes like well I worked there and there I I was you know in charge of this and that and yeah I'm just now looking for a new opportunity and I'm looking for a challenge and you just kind of sit there and you think oh my god is this really how I'm gonna begin my interview so okay. what what kind of advice do you have for people like me okay first thing can I talk to the interviewers yeah. interviewers don't ask that question okay don't ask that question because it has that effect on people they go oh my god where should I say it um, I, I, I carried out in preparation for the interviewing course I carried out a series of mock interviews with, with colleagues and LinkedIn uh, contacts and so on. And I used that question as an example. And I asked people to give a bad answer and a good answer to the question. And one of my candidates was very good. Uh, and she says, uh, oh, my name is uh, Jill and I have a pet dog called and I love taking him for walks and I like shopping. And, you know, so that was her bad answer to that question. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. She said, I, 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 I was born in 1984. I went to school at, uh, and then I went to school in, and I, and then my pet dog is. So people don't know how to answer. So interviewers don't ask the question. Um, if, and, and by the way, the, the interviewer is kind of trying to be helpful, believe it or not. Uh, they, they want to try to settle the person down, to talk about something that they know about. But in reality, it has the opposite effect. People go, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to say here? So I'm sticking with interviewers for a moment. I'll come back to what you should say in answer to it in a second. Um, for interviewers, a technique that I would like to use uh, in the beginning of the interview, um, and I use it very commonly, is to say, okay, Laura, um, looking through your career, and I've read your CV, and it's very impressive, and, and I've read the examples that you've given. Could you pick out for me, let's say, two highlights, two things that really stick in your mind that make you the great, the perfect candidate for this job? Okay. So I want them maybe to talk about their master's thesis or about this particular project or about the promotion that they got to and how that matches them with the role. Now, so that's my advice for interviewers. Don't say, tell us about yourself. If you're asked the question in future, Laura, be prepared for it and answer it in terms of what is it that they're looking for in the role? And you know that because they told you in the, in the advertisement, here's the competencies, here's what the role does. And pick out what you consider to be one or two or three of those that you have in spades, is an expression, that you have really strong. Uh, so don't tell them about your qualifications or about XYZ promotions or whatever. Tell them about this revenue increase that you achieved in uh, the role, this team that you managed to success with, this problem that you solved, this award that you won, because you know they're the things that the sort of things that they mentioned in their job, in, sorry, in their ad. Here's a, a, a hint for you. They don't have a lot of time for this, this particular question. It's probably about 90 seconds is your ideal answer to that question because they have five or six other competencies or areas that they have to cover in the 40 minutes that they have available to them. So they want to talk to you about your 
communication skills, about your um, problem solving, about your leadership and so on. So this is really just introduction piece and it's part of the four or five minutes that they have for that. So don't get into, I went to school that and my pet dog is and I love crochet and so on. Uh, but as an interviewer, Laura, don't ask the question. Gotcha. <laughs> I won't, and I hopefully will not be asked that question ever again. <laughs> uh, but then also, last question that I want to touch upon, because we kind of mentioned it here now. How much do you need to get into the personal things with the candidate? Because sometimes you get this, uh, you get these interviews and blogs when you talk about the experience, about the skill set, and then they're like, okay, so now it's like the last part of it. Let's just talk. So tell us about your hobbies. Is that needed mm. really? And if it is, why so? I'd have to be honest, for most of the roles that I've inter interviewed for uh, recently and in the past, uh, the whole area of hobbies has become largely just un unnecessary and, and people don't give it any time or much attention. Only if it has uh, relevance to the role. So if somebody is, um, you know, a counselor with, uh, with a charity, uh, and has experience in terms of handling problem uh, people and issues and challenges over the phone. That may be perfect for a role in HR, let's say. Um, and they may bring that into the discussion. You know, one of the things that I do in my spare time is I'm um, I'm a, a counselor on a, a, a suicide helpline. Uh, and that has given me the training and experience to deal with challenging issues that I think would be very common in the job uh, as HR consultant that you're looking for in your. So, so that's when it would come up. So, so I would not particularly encourage interviewers to say, oh, I see on your form, uh, you know, that you're a, an avid mountain climber. What mountains have you climbed? Um, you know, and I'm, I'm recruiting for a, an aircraft engineer. I can't see the connection there. If you have a lot of time available uh, at the end of the interview and you say, well, you know, I'm very happy that this client is perfect for us and well, then OK. Or the, the other possibility, I'm actually absolutely convinced that this candidate is not a suitable for the role, but you don't want to hoosh them out the door. You might have a little bit of time to have a little bit of chat with them and, and just finish on a nice positive note to talk about something that they're happy with. In general, I don't see it as being something that adds a lot. Uh, to the professional requirement that, you, that you're looking for in terms of the answer to the question, does this person have what it takes to do what we want them to do in the role that we're looking for? I see. Well, thanks for that, Martin. I mean, I think we could talk about this much, much more. I've got so many questions that I would love to ask you personally, but I don't think anyone wants to hear my issues when I'm interviewing. Uh, so I think that's our time for today. So thanks again for joining me, Martin. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you to leave our viewers with one piece of advice going into their next interview. What's one thing they need to remember? Smile. I'll tell you, it is so much easier as an interviewer to uh, think positively of somebody who comes across positively. Um, it was a piece of advice I got very early in my career. One of the, that job that I told you about in Aer Lingus, one of the techniques that they used was a group discussion technique. We didn't talk about that when we were talking about different things. And some organizations still use it, Laura. So they, they bring a group of people, uh, in my case it was 10, and they'll seat them in a circle and they'll say, we want you to discuss uh, television or popular music or crime or they just give you and they'll give you half an hour to discuss it amongst the 10 and they'll sit two or three of the interviewers will sit around the outside and not participate it's a very I, I've used this tech, technique myself subsequently in my career where I brought people in. and it's a, a very effective way of watching how people interact with relative strangers and you're not looking for brilliant ideas or wonderful um, uh, communication skills you're just looking for empathy and rapport and understanding and reasonable relationships um, so so somebody who says oh I thought uh, Sinead's idea was interesting there where she said that will score a lot of points as opposed to the person who says oh that's ridiculous uh, you know that won't come across very well but coming back to when I did that piece a piece of feedback that I got subsequently I was called to the next stage which was a one-to-one -one interview the guy says, Martin, you need to smile more. You don't have to be so serious. <laughs> and it's a really good piece of advice, but it's also good in the interview, in the one-to-one -one, uh, interview situation, or in the one-to, and even in the uh, virtual world. 
Um, but it links into my other point, Laura, that I made earlier on about the one key element of success, enthusiasm. And if I'm enthusiastic about stuff, you know, if you think about, I don't know what you, like, I like golf. When I think about it, it makes me smile. I, I like dogs. When I think about it, it makes me smile. When I'm enthusiastic about things, it shows. And that's what you want to show. So, smile. That's what I'm doing right now, Martin. Thank you very much for joining me. Everyone, if you want to watch Martin's course, just go to araclass.org, select it, and become a better interviewer or even help yourself get that better job that you want. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching and take care, everyone.